Why does our world focus so much on sin, guilt, fear, and blame? Hi, my name is Susie Porter, and I help women rewrite their lives so they can create their happily ever after. Today's topic that I want to share, I feel compelled to share, uh, it gets me kind of fired up because I grew up going to church. Um, when I was uh, five, my parents got a divorce. And uh, when I was seven, we moved to, no, when I was six, we moved to the projects. It's called the projects on the west side of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, a couple of years after the divorce, my dad molested me. And so there was plenty of shame and guilt to go around within me, around me, living in the projects with all the other single moms, uh, taking food stamps to go to the store to buy food, feeling that secret shame of being sexualized and not telling anyone, not even understanding what it was. My escape was hopping on the church bus that came to the poor neighborhood to take me to a wealthy suburb in Cleveland to Bethel Temple Pentecostal Church. Now, this was not a snake throwing crazy church. This was an upscale, wealthy church. I liked going there. They gave you chocolate bars in Sunday school. But even more than that, it was a place I could feel clean and safe. Our pastor used to preach about sin and forgiveness. And at the end of every sermon, he would give what Christians call an altar call. And he would ask, do you want to have your sins forgiven? Do you want to be born again? Which was super big in the 70s. And I said, yeah, uh-huh. Like lots of times. I walked down that aisle so many times I can't even count. And we would sing this song. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. And you would go into the prayer room and kneel and pray the sinner's prayer. They'd give you a big fat Bible and you would go home all forgiven. I believed in sin. I believed in guilt and I felt shame. And I tried my best for years to be a good Christian. No, not just a good Christian. The best fucking Christian. <laughs> the best. I even went to a Bible college when I was 17, Fort Wayne Bible College, which at the time was was known the, the Harvard of Bible College because some of the uh, some of the most expert Bible scholars taught there. And one of my teachers even uh, interpreted a couple books in the New International version of the Bible, which at the time was this was the uh, the most accurate version of the Bible. So I dove deep into the Bible and I thought I was going to be so happy at Fort Wayne Bible College. I couldn't wait to get there, right? After being a freaky Christian in high school, I would be with my people. Well, after two years, I went, I went to go back for my junior year. I had my roommates. I had everything set. And I just, I felt sick. I felt wrong. I felt off. I just couldn't stay. I couldn't explain to my mom why, but I didn't stay for my junior year. I got out. I left. And then from then, my spiritual life was kind of in a rut for years until the early 90s when I walked into my very first Course in Miracles lecture. And I got this book and I met Marion Williamson. I had never seen anyone like her in my life. Certainly not at the Bible college, certainly not in any of the churches I went to, and certainly not in any of the people I hung out with in Cleveland. She was back in like the early 90s. She was in her early 30s. So she used to dress. She was much different than she is now. I mean, she's the same, but she had she wasn't famous yet. She wasn't well known. She wasn't uh, involved in politics yet publicly. So she used to dress like Stevie Nicks and she would come out. And she was just beautiful and so brilliantly smart and intellectual. And she would weave together these lectures and she would quote the Course in Miracles and she'd talk about her mother and her relationships. And she would talk about Jesus like someone she loved and about being Jewish. It totally blew my mind. I, I got so excited. My soul came alive. I felt like I can believe in Jesus and be an intellectual and bring my intellect into this process. 
it opened the door of all the metaphysical teachings to me. And every step of the way, I was scared. Because when you go to a fundamentalist, conservative, Christian Bible college, oh, they ingrain in your mind very deeply that only the 66 books of the Bible are the inerrant word of God and everything else is blasphemy, occult. You know, they teach you that nothing else is the word of God. And so to believe that the Course of Miracles was channeled by Jesus himself was quite a leap. So I started reading it and I, I didn't believe it right away. Yet I would write in the margins uh, where the Course would say, it takes great understanding to learn that all situation, events, and relationships are for your highest good. I was like, that's what Romans 8.28 said. All things work together for, for those who love God. And I kept finding all these parallels and it made sense to me. In another video, I'll talk about the I Am Discourses, which is an even freakier woo-woo book that Jesus channels a few of the channel and I read a few of the chapters. And I realized that these I ideas might be out there if you've just gone to church all your life and you're very fundamental, which I was. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. What did I know of metaphysics and Los Angeles and all of these woo-woo things? I knew nothing of it. I was afraid to even get my tarot cards read that I would burn in hell forever and that it was from the devil. That's what I used to believe. But anyway, to get back to the theme of this, the, the biggest difference I see, and I do believe that Jesus channeled the course, and I do believe, and I do love the Bible, but I interpret it probably from a more enlarged uh, place than I used to. For, I definitely do. The biggest difference is the concept of sin. Uh, the Christian churches and the preachers that I was influenced by for the first uh, 10, 25 years of my life taught, emphasized very heavily on guilt and sin and the need for forgiveness. Now, in the Course of Miracles, Jesus says there's no such thing as sin. That sin is the product of an insane mind, that we projected it from our fearful place when we believed that when Adam believed that God kicked him out of the garden and that that's not true, that if you believe that you don't even know who God is, you don't even understand the first thing about God. So this is a radical difference. Sin, either, either Jesus died for our sins or Jesus says there's no such thing as sin. And he goes on and on in the course about how your innocence is guaranteed by God and only through forgiveness and only through seeing the innocence in each other. When you see guilt in your brother or anyone, you acknowledge it in yourself. And all minds are joined, the Course teaches. So whether it's religion or the news or politics or whatever uh, voices we hear in our culture and in society and in the media that emphasize guilt, especially this, ooh, Cancel culture, it is cruel and so filled with, fueled by so much hate and ignorance and cruelty. What if the biggest sin is emphasizing and believing in guilt and sin? The word sin, because I went to a Bible college, I know that the word sin is just a Greek term. It's actually an archery term, which means missing the mark. It's like, you're a little off. You didn't hit the bullseye. You're a little off. And some interpretations mean say that it even means you're inauthentic. So the biggest sin is not being your true self, not being authentic. And our true selves is not hate, which is something that we, a machination of our crazy mind, our true essence is love. And we are scared to death of love because it's something larger than us. It's something we didn't create, right? We created hate. We can live with hate. We can live with fear. We can live with guilt, blame, sin. Sure, we're comfortable with those. Let's, let's wear crosses around our neck and emphasize the crucifixion. Let's do the stations of the cross. Let's emphasize the blood and the pain and the suffering. It is such bullshit. In my one woman show, I come out with a huge uh, six foot cross that my Jewish husband husband made me. <laughs> and, I, and, and I played the character of Jesus and he threw it down and he said, I hate crosses. 
The whole point was the resurrection. I've been alive forever. And yet, what do you guys emphasize? The crucifixion in those three days I was dead. All right, I'm going to take a breath because this subject does get me riled up. And I just want to end this video with just a suggestion that perhaps, just perhaps, just maybe, these pastors and preachers and so-called experts on the Bible and the word of God, maybe, just maybe, they might be super smart. They might have our best interests at heart. But what if there's more to the story? What if the messages that we've heard our whole lives and for thousands of years since Jesus left this earth have come from a place of fear and, have, and are off? What if the truth about us is our innocence? What if it's true that our innocence is guaranteed by God? What if we saw that innocence in each other? How different would our world be? I want to end just with a, a beautiful couple sentences from A Course in Miracles. The betrayal of the Son of God lies only in illusions. And all his sins, there's literal uh, parentheses around this word sins, are but his own imagining. His reality is forever sinless. He need not be forgiven, but awakened. I'm so glad that I, that I was able to open my mind and to receive a larger, bigger picture of Christ's consciousness and love and innocence and connection. The Course says only the love is real, and what isn't love is a cry for love. So the next time you're tempted to judge someone, to see the guilt in someone else, to feel the guilt in yourself, just remember or just consider. Maybe this doesn't come from God. If, and if the word God is difficult for you, and I don't blame you, it's a lot of baggage on that word. Think that God is love. What if God is actually, in essence, love? What if that is what God is? What if that is the fabric of the universe is actually love? Even though there are laws that are impersonal, I get that. What if there's also a, an, a, a, a component of the divine that is love, that is that quality and power and presence of love? Would that presence of love want you to feel guilty and ashamed and afraid? Do you want your children to feel guilty and ashamed and afraid and bad about themselves? Or do you want them and, and do you want everyone you love to feel that freedom that comes from innocence? You can be free of guilt and fear and even the belief in sin. You can be. And I encourage you to, to consider that innocence might be the truth and that sin might be a lie. Thank you. God bless you.